Well, thank you, Andrea. Thanks very much for organizing this exciting event. The heading on the promotion for this webinar is uh, actually translating keen ideals into curriculum, and that's perfect. The title describes the shared goal of the presenters and the participants. And further, it's really appropriate to kick off this new series of webinars. Webinar series will provide uh, our hosts with a means of disseminating specific work that deserves to be highlighted. And webinars provide us with a platform for connecting people who have similar expertise and passion, people that are in your own field, for connecting the best methods of invigorating students with an entrepreneurial mindset. This particular work speaks to some exciting uh, teaching and methods that have been developed at WPI, or Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Mass. And their recent work has been sponsored through a strategic investment grant the Kern Family Foundation calls Topical Grants. These grants are aimed at creating shareable resources needed by the network to do what the series suggests, translating keen ideals into the curriculum. And we kindly asked this group from WPI to provide the first in this webinar series because they have something to share with you right now that can serve as a tool or a model for your work and gladly they accept it. So we're very pleased to have presenting today four faculty members of WPI. It's Glenn Gaudet of Biomedical Engineering, Terry Camasano of Chemical Engineering, Frank Hoy, the Director of Collaborative for Entre Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Janice Gobert of Learning Sciences, Social Sciences, and Policy Studies. And the topic, as you'll discover, is a computer-assisted learning environment to support engineering design, innovation, and entrepreneurship, all aimed at developing an entrepreneurial mindset. So without further ado, let's turn it over to them and see what they have for us. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, I thank everybody for uh, joining us today and giving us the opportunity to talk uh, about some of the work that uh, the Kern Family Foundation, as Doug mentioned, has uh, supported, very excited about it. Um, so we're going to talk about the computer learning based, uh, computer based learning environment to support engineering design, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Um, as Doug mentioned, I'm Glenn Gaudet. I'm an associate professor in biomedical engineering. I'm Janice Gobert. I'm head of the Learning Sciences and Technologies program, and I'm cross appointed in social science and computer science. I'm Terry Camisano. I'm a professor of chemical engineering and assistant dean of engineering at WPI. Frank Hoy. I'm professor of innovation and entrepreneurship in the School of Business at WPI. I'm Ermal Toto. I'm a software engineer and PhD student with Professor Janice Gobert in the Learning Science and Technology program. Hi, I'm Azgir Shaj. I'm also a PhD student in the Learning Science and Technology program. Uh, hi, my name is Elahe Kamalu, and I'm a PhD candidate in Chemical Engineering Department. So I'd like to start with telling you a little bit about our objectives for this webinar. What we want to do today is provide information on the development of a new simulation that we designed for college freshmen that incorporates engineering design. This simulation provides students with the opportunity for project-based learning in both engineering design and entrepreneurship. Through completion of the project, professors obtain data that allows them to assess the students' engineering design skills and entrepreneurial knowledge. And also through the webinar, we'd like to gauge interest in developing other engineering micro-worlds and deploying them through Keen. So our overall goals for the project this year have been to introduce first-year students in engineering to both engineering design and entrepreneurship. We wanted to develop an engineering design micro world, which you'll hear a lot about in just a few minutes. And we wanted this micro world to include variables that relate to entrepreneurship. And finally, we wanted to assess students' learning and skills in these areas. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what our, our background is here in the development of computer assess assisted learning and assessment systems. So my group is called SLINK, Science Learning by Inquiry, and we have developed with the help of uh, National Science Foundation uh, funding and U.S. Department of Education funding an intelligent tutoring system called INCITS, um, Inquiry Intelligent Tutoring System that assesses and tutors students in real time as they use these interactive simulations called micro-worlds. So we've developed 25 of these uh, to date. 
This provides, INKITS provides an environment for students to hone their content knowledge and inquiry skills that we hear a lot about uh, through the National Next Generation um, Science Standards. It generates real-time assessment reports that are automatically sent to teachers, and it's undergirded by educational data mining and knowledge-based uh, uh, knowledge engineering algorithms that we have two patents uh, pending on. Um, so our, our goal on this project, or our work on this project, is we did the microworld technical development, um, Ermal Tocho, who's here, and we also did the analytical work, the design of algorithms to auto-score the data in real time as the students work. So I'd like to uh, jump right into the microworld that uh, uh, we developed here that Janice just told you a little bit about. Um, and in a minute, we'll actually uh, give you uh, an image of the micro world and then after that uh, we'll go into the micro world uh, directly and you can see um, the micro world in, in, in our inputs and we'll change things and show you how it updates in real time. Um, so when the students log on to their uh, account to, to enter the micro world, the first thing they're presented with is this uh, uh, the movie at the top of the screen that you see here. I'm not going to play it for you, but we do have usernames for everybody, and so you can uh, enter the micro world and play the, the video. I just want to point out this is a video that um, you know, the King Group and the Kern Family Foundation uh, developed themselves, and it really talks about uh, developing the entrepreneurial mindset and how this can really help engineers, uh, I think, in the future, and kind of changing uh, the mindset a little bit from the traditional engineering to the what we what we've been calling the entrepreneurial mindset and the entrepreneurial engineer. Um, and after they view the movie, they're giving, uh, given some text and, and, and basically uh, they're, they're told that uh, they've been hired recently by a small startup company and they're interested in entering the catheter market. Uh, this company brings several resources to the, to the table including the market, sales, finance, and distribution and the job of the student is to design the catheter uh, and to get them ready for, for market and to, to sell them. So then uh, the student then in the next screen uh, they're instructed that they'll be able to change several design uh, attributes. They're also instructed that once they enter the micro world they can change their selections and go through the process uh, multiple times and that they can essentially build and design uh, different numbers of catheters and they can rebuild it um, as many times as they would like and then they can draw some conclusions from that. So here's an example of the micro world itself and what a, a student uh, might see once they've changed some of the parameters. And so the inputs for the student are shown on the left here under engineering and so they have several drop down boxes. They're asked to design a catheter and so they can either select a venous catheter or a Foley catheter. And these are two different types of catheters and they're provided with a little bit of background but not too much on these two catheters um, because we actually want the students to go out and learn a little bit about these, these different catheters and really explore the, the web and explore all their resources and find out what they can about the different catheters. The next drop down box uh, offers them a, a selection of diameters for the catheters and essentially which size catheter they want to select. Then the next drop down box after that is the length of the catheter and then the material for the catheter. And so here you can see that in this example we chose a venous catheter. It's a 32 French uh, diameter catheter and it's uh, 37 and a half to 42 and a half centimeters in length and it's made of, of latex. The students then have uh, different what we call additions, little check boxes that they can add. So for example, if they wanted to make their catheter wire reinforced, they could do that. If they wanted to make it antithrombotic, if they wanted a silicone coated, make it antimicrobial, or uh, provide a radio opaque strip, which when uh, the physicians take an x-ray will tell them where the catheter is, they can add any one, all or none of these uh, add-ons as we call them. Uh, and that is essentially the, the engineering side of it. And they're, they're also uh, given business attributes that they can select also. When I was hired at WPI five years ago, the president informed me that WPI produces great problem solvers. But his view was that wasn't good enough anymore. That if just going out and being handed a problem 
would not be satisfactory in today's global competitive environment. So he wanted them to leave here with an entrepreneurial mindset, thinking ahead about the opportunities in the marketplace and, and making sure that students would understand that the market would influence the engineering decisions they would have to make. So as you can see in this particular example, uh, the students had to assess what market share they might be able to acquire, uh, what supplies they were going to have to order, which influences the cost that, uh, that the product was going to incur, and what price they were going to charge. And so if you look at the, res at the initial results for this particular student, uh, the student got a very high engineering score and wound up losing money. And so the students had to adjust understanding that price and cost would influence what people would actually buy. So we're finding that students are very good at, ass at assessing the product characteristics, and now they have to take that additional step to think about the market. So the options at this, uh, that actually we selected here, but as an example of students, um, selected are shown down at the bottom. And so their first build, as we call it, was a venous catheter. And here's the cross-sectional area, the material, the length. They had a, a, a wire reinforced. They did not select antithrombotic. Uh, they did not select silicone coated or antimicrobial, but they did include a radio-opaque strip. And this gave them an engineering score of 92. They projected their market share initially to be at 6%. They bought enough supplies uh, to make 5,000 uh, catheters. Um, the, they set their price at $10 per catheter. Uh, we estimated that it cost them um, $8.33 uh, per catheter to make it. Their actual market share based on that low price uh, that we calculated for them was 13.8. The market price um, that we projected for that catheter with those features was $25. And this was their market size. And so they ended up, as Frank mentioned, had a, uh, they lost money. So then we went back and we changed a few things. And so we still left the Venus catheter. We uh, still used the 32 French. We still made it out of latex. But we turned off the wire, and then we rebuilt the model. Our engineering score dropped, but now we're actually uh, uh, making a small profit. We went back, turned off the wire, rebuilt the uh, catheter, and now we're actually uh, turning more of a profit. And so to put the wire into the catheter costs money, and so that essentially is, is yeah, there's a little bit more to it than that, but that essentially is uh, the reason why we started increasing profit. So now we'd like to actually take you to the micro world. Um, so in usernames um, have been sent by uh, the current family foundation, I believe. And so everybody uh, should have a, a username. And so you can go on whenever, you would, uh, whenever you'd like. Um, we're going to pull it up right now. The micro worlds work best in uh, Google Chrome. They uh, have a couple glitches in Internet Explorer that are currently being worked out. Um, so when you log on to the uh, to the site, you'll see here the um, username and password. And so you can enter your, your username and password um, supplied by the uh, Kern Family Foundation. And once you log in, you want to go to My Courses, WPI Bioengineering. And then here's the uh, catheter lab, uh, the catheter lab, which is what uh, what we develop. And uh, it's listed under the 12th of December to the 18th of December because that's when we actually assign this um, to, to students to complete. And so that's why it's, it's listed there. And so then you can click on the catheter lab and attempt the quiz now. And here's the movie I had mentioned. And so the students would click play and they would um, listen to the movie. Um, we're going to skip that there. Um, and so we can go to the next one. I'd like to make a small technical uh, clarification. 
if the activity doesn't fit properly on your screen, if you are on a PC, you can use the control and plus and minus buttons to zoom in or out. And if you are on a Mac, you can use the command and plus and minus buttons to zoom in and out. And this might be useful, especially uh, when the micro world is up and if you have a small screen resolution. So then the students are given the uh, introduction up top here. And this is essentially what I uh, just mentioned in the last slide. And so they give a little information on catheters. And then they're told that they're starting uh, to work for a small startup uh, a company. Of course, being entrepreneurial engineers, they started a very good salary. Um, <laughs> And then in the next screen, they can enter the, uh, the micro world. That's and so again, they click next. And here's the micro world. And so Amal is hitting uh, control minus to change the, um, the size <clears throat> of the screen. And this is uh, uh, similar to the screen I just showed you. And so we'll select a catheter type. And so we'll do a, um, a Foley catheter. We then can select our, cro our uh, cross-sectional diameter, and we'll do a 14 French, and then catheter length. We we'll go 30. Uh, yeah, we'll go 35 to 37, and then the catheter material. Of course, each catheter material has a different uh, cost associated with it. We'll go with uh, latex to start with, and if we're building a, a fully catheter. Um, Maybe we want to make it uh, anti-thrombotic. Uh, that probably wouldn't be too good, too helpful, but that's okay. Um, and maybe we want to make it antimicrobial. And then we can go over to the marketing side. Okay, so in this, uh, in this example, uh, one of the things that we did in the classroom, the focus of the class was primarily on engineering. But we introduced the notion that just because you design a product doesn't mean that people will buy it. And so you have to anticipate that there's going to be competition. So we wanted the students to be able to estimate market share. So perhaps in, in an example, they might have estimated that if there were 10 competitors out there that, uh, that introducing a new product might get them a 5% market share. And then they had to estimate the supplies that they would purchase. So they might uh, purchase out of a range of uh, one to a million, a thousand in supplies. And then they had to price their product. So uh, in, uh, they might select a price of $15 to, uh, uh, to launch their new product and introduce it to the market. And what we tried to introduce them to in the classroom was that that people wouldn't necessarily buy a maximum price and you weren't necessarily going to get 100% of the market as soon as you opened your doors and introduced your new product. So they had to estimate where they might fit and, uh, and if they purchased too many supplies, they were going to encounter additional costs. If they overpriced, that would reduce their sales, but similarly, if they underpriced, then the customer might feel that it was a low quality product and that would reduce sales. So the students had to assess what the market would react to the new product introduction. So in this particular case, you can see from the inputs that, uh, that we provided in this example, we wind up with a product a profit of $1,000 and then the students can take the next step of adjusting, readjusting, doing an iteration through this process and uh, adjusting the different figures or the different selections to see what the impact would be on the profit. We actually have a question from the audience and the participant's name is Jay Goldberg and he is from Marquette University. I will now activate his microphone. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Barely. Yes, you can speak a little bit louder, Jay, please. Okay. Uh, is this working through my webcam microphone? That is correct. We, we can, can hear you loud and clear now. You can hear me now? Okay. 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 My question is, um, back on the engineering score, 
How is that determined? What factors go into that? Rick, um, so the factors that go into the engineering score are uh, the diameter for the catheter. And so if they're going to design a Foley catheter, obviously you want a smaller diameter because there's a larger uh, population that needs the smaller diameter rather than a, a larger diameter. Um, and so we basically we have a bunch of equations in there uh, that kind of optimize the design for the length, the diameter, and then the material. Um, and for example, if they use a silicone material and they coat it with silicone, they're going to get a penalty for that, right? Because there's no need to silicone coat a right. silicone material. Yeah. Um, and so in, and in regards to a, um, a Foley catheter, for example, it's not really going to be carrying blood. So to make it antithrombotic doesn't really, yeah, doesn't address any functions that a Foley catheter uh, would have where if it was a uh, venous catheter returning blood to a cardiopulmonary bypass pump, that might be useful there. So in this case here, they would receive points off of that engineering score. Um, so we essentially try to optimize the design uh, through the use of equations. Um, and so when they switch some of these different uh, options, they either increase their engineering score or will decrease their engineering score. All right, so so some of these scores they're they're they are based on the the customer needs. For example, you said if if it's a fully if it's a urological application, you don't need an antithrombotic you don't have a thrombotic coating on it. So that's not really needed. So they lose points for that. But if it's something that is needed and they provide it, then they probably get a higher score. So it is somewhat based on needs. Yes, correct. Yep, yep. And we set that up ourselves, you know, kind of behind the scenes, and so. Um, yeah, if we were to design um, a different device, uh, we could change that equation however we see fit. And so in this case here, yeah, those are the parameters that we entered into the, into the equation. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, if we were designing uh, a new coffee cup and we had a different set of parameters, um, you know, it's based on what we as engineers feel uh, would address the need. Right. Okay. And then, and then I, I, can I follow that up with another question about the uh, the market share that you're calculating? Yeah. What goes into that calculation? I mean, there's some price sensitivity there. As you change the price, you're you're assuming you know it's going to affect who's going to buy it, which is probably correct. But but what things go into that calculation? Because because I, all I see is you change a number and another one changes, but I'm not sure what's you know what's happening behind the scenes there. Yeah, we had to build in some relatively arbitrary uh, uh -huh. uh, determinations here to make it simple and straightforward for the students. So the, right. the idea was, again, an, es an assessment of how many companies were already competing with this in this product line. And then, so what was realistic for them to uh, estimate that they could get market share? If there were right. 10 companies that were already in the industry with products on the market, uh, the likelihood that, uh, that they could suddenly take over a hundred percent share of the market was pretty remote mm -hmm. so you know so we built in some parameters to you know to essentially limit their opportunity to gain market share so that if they if they ordered products to if they ordered a million supplies to to satisfy a hundred percent of the market uh, they were going to have a huge cost with uh, with very few sales uh, right. because because the 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 parameters wouldn't let them go up to 100%. Great. Okay. All right. Thanks for answering the questions. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Mm -hmm. um, so now, um, as an so let me just quickly go over the uh, what we call the build data here down at the bottom. So the student will see that this was their first build in the Foley and all their um, all the parameters they entered in, and in this case here. Um, in regards to their projected market share, they projected at 5%, but their actual uh, market share was 4.71. Um, and the market price that we would estimate for these catheters is at $23. Um, so now the student could go back and say, okay, the engineering score was a little low. Um, and so we could uncheck antithrombotic because we think we don't need that, and we could rebuild the, the catheter. And now you can see that our engineering score has gone up to 81.5. And because we're no longer buying um, you know, these antithrombotic surface coatings and we're no longer doing that, that has re uh, reduced the cost that it takes us to build these uh, catheters. 
and so that entail has increased our profit, and so we're actually making some uh, a little bit of more money on this here. Um, if then we said, okay, well, you know, the market price is at thirteen dollars, maybe we want to. Well, one of the things, for example, we could say is um, we want to increase our our market share. Maybe we don't have enough supplies, and so let's increase our supply line to five thousand. So then the student could just go in here, type in 5,000, rebuild it, and now you can see that they're actually um, able to produce more, uh, uh, more of these, and so they're actually able to get more profit. Um, and so this here is an example of they could you know, then change the price. They could um, you know, $13 rebuild, and now they're actually uh, making slightly less, although their market share has actually increased. Um, but they're actually the profit is less, and they can also change their engineering uh, parameters. Uh, for example, to put a radio opaque strip in there, rebuild it, and change their uh, improve their engineering score, and that also changes their actual market share. Um, although they left the the price at thirteen dollars, and now because we added that radio opaque strip, it costs more money to, to build it, and so they've actually decreased their profit. Um, and based on each one of these clicks and each one of these builds, Janice and her team can evaluate that, and they'll go into a little bit of the data as to uh, some of the data we collected and kind of uh, our interpretation of what, what that means. So we have we'll another back. question from the audience. Okay. It is right. Sue Tavacoli from Kettering, and I will now allow him to speak. Hello, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, well, it's just a simple question. Um, the engineering score, uh, do you train the student to, to be a good judge of what score is good enough? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, that that's an interesting question, and I think you know, we'll, in, in a couple slides you'll see some of the data, um, and what I would suggest is we would like to train them for that. Uh, in some cases, I think we do a good job, and in some cases, we don't do a good job. And so, what you'll see with some of the data is some school, some students had a perfect hundred engineering score, uh, but their profits were very low. Right. I'll just jump in for a second here too. So I think the goal in this study was to get a sense of what they would do in an environment like this when they're balancing the engineering and the entrepreneurship because some students have real talent for this and they see, oh, okay, with these engineering, this engineering spec, I can build the absolute best uh, catheter on the planet, but it's going to cost way more than the market will bear. So obviously, I'm, not, I'm never going to stay in business. So I can figure out what is the balance between the engineering parameters and the business parameters such that I can sell uh, my product and undercut my competitor. I right? under, understood. Uh, I'll wait for the rest of the presentation, but I'm looking for the answer to where is the, where is the minimum line that the engineer should draw and how is that taught? In other words, can I build a capital here that absolutely doesn't function, yet I won't know it? I would say uh, if, you know, if the score is too low and it doesn't function, then you know, the profits are going to be, uh, in some cases, negative. Um, but yeah, exactly where that line is, I, I, well, you know. That do, so maybe I should ask it like this. Is there a direct inverse correlation between engineering score and profit? So the engineering score does play a role in the profit. Um, but it's in, in uh, you know, we I, I forget exactly the percentage that we we set it uh, you know the percentage of a role that it plays but it does play a role in calculating the profits uh, but it's not the sole uh, factor in calculating the profits understood but, uh, but I, I, as I, the en as the engineering score goes down will the profits always go up whether it's proportional or not. I'd like to give uh, my perspective from the software engineering part of it, uh, building the model. It, it's actually a system dynamics model of engineering parameters and uh, business parameters. And I think we, uh, the, the score has a, a small effect, the engineering score has a small effect on the higher range, 
So if you look at between 90 and 100, the effect is small. But as the engineering score decreases, then the effect becomes larger and larger to the point that if you have a score lower than uh, 40 to 50, then you'll have almost no profit or you, you'll even uh, incur some losses. So it's, it's a system dynamics model. The, the whole thing, it, it takes all the variables are, are interconnected in, in ways. Understood. And the software development. Uh, so yeah, this will become clearer, I think, as we proceed. Okay, understood. I'll, I'll wait. Thank okay. You. But if we don't answer the question, come on back to us. Yes. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to go back to um, the slideshow and again everybody should have um, you know a username and the password uh, is one two three four and if uh, if you haven't received one and you'd like one um, if you could email the current family foundation uh, Andrea will uh, uh, get you a, a username so you can try it so I can see that everybody's really anxious to see our data. I'm just going to very quickly tell you a little bit more about the design so that we can have most of the time to spend on looking at the data. So we mentioned we did this in classes for first year engineering students. So we had introduction to chemical engineering and introduction to biomedical engineering that both participated. There were 51 students in total who completed the assignment. Um, in one of the classes, this was required, and in the other class, it was done for extra credit. For each student who completed the assignment, there were log files generated. So every single change in every parameter that the students recorded or, or manipulated was recorded, and all of their scores were tabulated. You'll see some examples of this data in just a minute. So when we looked at the log data and we started analyzing it, what we wanted to know is whether the students were systematic in their manipulation of the variables. So did they make a big jump in changing the length or were they trying to change things systematically? We wanted to learn whether they included market specs in order to optimize their profit. We also had, I don't think you could see it on the screen, but when you log in later on your own, you'll see under the catheter we had open response questions. So in addition to making the catheter, we asked the students a few questions. Oh, here they are. So we asked them their self-reported analysis of how, how did you choose this catheter, what parameters influence you, and we got a lot of really good feedback out of the open response questions. You'll see some examples of that in just a minute. Um, the evaluation, I think this was just answered in one of the questions. So we mentioned that we had an engineering score, and this was a nonlinear function um, that took into account a lot of the different material properties, and also that we had a score based on the, the for the profits that were based on things like cost, market price, supplies, and market share. Let me brief you give briefly give you a little statistics and then you're going to see some real data. So the average number of trials that a student completed was 54, but you can see there was quite a bit of range there. So um, one student made 238 different trials. Um, we could see that for some students this was just a really appealing project. Some people really enjoyed the micro world and enjoyed the challenge of it and wanted to keep working until they had maximized their profits. I'm not sure why that one um, minimum, uh, you know, one student who made only one trial, you know, clearly that was someone that just didn't get interested in this project. And the average engineering score was 82, again, with a pretty big range. And then the maximum amount of profit this was done through the way that we set up the study. The maximum profit was not the same depending on which of the two catheters they chose. And we didn't tell them which one to choose. It was completely their choice. So in this case, you could have made a lot more money with the Foley than with the Venus. And the average market share that the students were able to achieve was 6%, again, with a pretty big range. Um, now Janice is going to give you some examples about the data. Great. So on this slide, what we have is actually a reduced um, 
set of data that depict one, uh, one subject who built a Foley catheter, you can see on the far left, and then these under area, you have the various manipulations that they uh, made for area, and then um, similarly length material, wire, radio, antithrombotic, silicone coat, antimicrobial, and some of those are add-ons as we uh, previously uh, heard from Glenn. So using those parameters, we are able to get a, an engineering score. Now, when we talk about how systematic they are, what we really mean is are they varying only one thing at a time and testing the effects on their engineering design? Because of course, if they change multiple variables at once, they actually will have a very hard time determining what variable led to the better engineering score. So we then use our algorithms to derive how systematic they're being across their trials in terms of engineering design and manipulating those parameters in a systematic way to come to that conclusion. Um, so with this log file, we generate data, but as a professor, if you were to use this as an assessment, you'd get a sense of how systematic students are and actually how they're how they're learning. So if you had a series of these micro worlds, what you could do is say, well, here's John, my, my subject John. On the first trial with the first set of micro worlds, he um, really didn't attend to the entrepreneurial side of the, of the uh, um, development. But as they, as they engaged in more micro worlds, they actually were able to balance the engineering and design specs. So it would give the professor a really good sense of how well the student was um, acquiring these concepts and integrating them into the design. So on the next slide, what you see is we categorized, um, Ermal and Osge uh, worked on this um, quite hard actually. We categorized students into four quadrants. So on the top left, what you have is high engineering, low business. So high engineering means they were actually systematic, as I previously described, in changing the engineering parameters and testing the effects of those. However, these students, of which there were 23 who fed in, fell into this category, were not necessarily systematic with how they varied their business parameters. They had very little regard for market value, and they didn't seem to be able to compromise the engineering side with the business side. All right, so this is uh, very good information for a professor to be able to know how and who to address with respect to the uh, business side. Now moving over to the high, the ideal students, right, the high engineering, high business side, there's 22 in that grouping. These students are very systematic in changing their engineering parameters, but they're also systematic in changing their business parameters. They seem to be market driven and they're willing to compromise. So they understand that the absolute ideal of an engineering uh, design may not yield a good entrepreneurial score because really they have to balance this with what the market will bear and their competitors, right? Um, so that's really an attractive, you know, that, that's the ideal, right, to be in that quadrant. Now following uh, down on the bottom left, you see we have three students only that fell into the low engineering, low business score, right? So that provides the professor lots of fodder for how to, who to educate, and then, you know, if there were the right kinds of modules, how you might educate students. And um, on the right-hand side, you have low engineering but high business side, and we actually have nobody in that category, okay? So this, this set of data um, allows you to assess how students are doing in this design, and in future, if we were to design more micro worlds, we could react in real time as, as our system does, our, our inquiry intelligent tutoring system, as I told you, reacts in real time and tutors the students. All right, um, Ermal's gonna talk a little bit more about the relationship between profit and engineering. So on this slide, uh, we have a scatter plot of the engineering scores on the x-axis and of the profits on the y-axis. Uh, it's, it's debatable on how to interpret this, but there are a couple stories you could see. First, you have uh, the Foley versus uh, Venus catheters, and even though the Venus catheter, the students that chose the Venus catheter had high engineering scores, they all had low uh, business scores because their profits were low. This, uh, again, we didn't tell them which catheter to choose, and if they were business-oriented, 
they wouldn't have uh, sort of grabbed into the, the venous catheter and stay with it. They would have explored all the options and made compromises, even though they might have wanted to do a, a, a ven venous catheter but, uh, badly, they, they could have said, well, this is not really good for my profits. Because remember, they were hired to make profit for a company. They, we put that in the introduction. The other story we see that even within Foley, we, the students are sort of uh, split in two groups. We have a group that has uh, fairly high engineering and uh, fairly high business scores, but the engineering, it's, it's not at the, the 100 level. Uh, those are actually the, the Venus catheter of people. And then we have another group that has high engineering uh, but a low business score. So it's similar to the other uh, slide we saw previously, but you, you could see here on, on the scatter plot how, how, the, how, how they're sort of uh, clustering in this two. Uh, if you did a cluster analysis, it would be clear who are the uh, high business, high engineering, and high engineering and uh, uh, high and low business. And because of this uh, relation in the data, we can auto score these categories. And so th this that would be useful to the professors. So when we look at all of the engineering scores, I would say this is not a very surprising distribution. So the average engineering score was about 82. And what's interesting is that there's a few that are higher than that. And as we talked about, those may have been the students who didn't recognize the need to make some compromises in lowering their engineering score. And there's also a few at the the really low end. But I, I think if you ignore that, that outlier at the really low end of the engineering score, I think this shows that the engineering score is very important to the students, um, which makes sense. These are all first year students in engineering, and I, I think it was natural that they were very focused on the engineering score. So. As Terry indicated, uh, no, no great surprises here. Um, uh, we tried to represent the results in a variety of ways because we, we want each professor to be able to uh, put together uh, the graphs or the histograms or whatever, you know, whatever speaks to them and to their students on the results that are obtained. With this one, looking at profit, it really leaps out at you that, uh, you know, the essentially half the students just focused on trying to get the best engineering score they could. You know, just a natural idea. This is, you know, this is what you would expect from these entering freshmen that, that are saying that this, they want a career in engineering. They love to developing the product. Um, and then we got uh, about half the students that, uh, that recognized that they needed to make a profit if they were going to introduce this product. And so, uh, so they did as Janice mentioned, engaged in, in a systematic review of how they could adjust both the, the product and market conditions to increase the product level. And, uh, and so what the professor gets from this is essentially a real-time response on, uh, on how the students are absorbing what's being introduced to them in the classroom and letting you know that, uh, okay, I, you know, Half my students are starting to recognize the market requirements. And half, half really need to understand that, yes, well, developing a, an engineering score is a positive thing. Uh, those products aren't necessarily going to be bought by anyone. And so we need to, we need to figure out how the market is going to react. So where do we want to go from here? Well, we really uh, value your feedback. Um, especially in regards to you know, the technical challenge presented. Is this, um, is this something that makes sense at a first year engineering student? You know, our students, um, I think you saw three students that had we call what we considered low engineering, low business score. I would suggest those three students are, are not engaged. Um, I think the, uh, the rest of the students were pretty engaged in the process. But uh, is this a, a realistic technical challenge to present to first year students, engineering students? Um, does the link between the technical and business challenge make sense? Uh, is there any interest in, in other uh, micro worlds, developing other micro worlds for uh, learning and assessment? I think one of the things that uh, you know, came to me when I first saw the data and this, the split between the high engineering, high business, and the high engineering, low business is 
if we were to give another micro world, say at the end of the class, can we move those 22 students who are high engineering, low business to high engineering, high business? Um, to me, that's essentially what would define the entrepreneurial engineer, um, the high engineering, high business side. Um, and then also, you know, what data from the micro world uh, would be useful for assessment for, uh, for, for folks teaching at the, the college level? So, um, and that concludes our, our, our presentation. And I want to really thank uh, Doug Melton and the uh, Kern Family Foundation and uh, the Keen Network. It's uh, fantastic working with these folks. I want to thank everybody for listening. And if you have any uh, questions, we'd be happy to try to address them now. And if you have any feedback you want to provide us um, at any other time, you know, we'd be great to, to be great to have that. You can either send it directly to me. My email address is Godet at wpi.edu, or I'm sure if you get it to uh, Andrea or Doug, they'd forward it to us. Thank Glenn, you very much. Glenn, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. As, as the uh, participants are forming maybe some final questions, I just wanted to add a couple of comments at the end. And uh, one of these is that this is a, uh, this, the purpose again today was to introduce everyone to an online tool that can give instructors something new that maybe they haven't used to convey entrepreneurial mindset. And keep in mind that, the, that your test, your, your study here is on pilot, your pilot project here is with freshmen. So this is not about startups. This is getting freshmen acquainted and even framing their engineering career with the importance of understanding these different concepts and how they're connected together. Uh, when, when you first presented this around catheters, I kind of had a big question mark in my mind. But, you know, I'm discovering the importance of this medical device, and your students are discovering the importance of the medical device and how it's highly engineered, and the fact that this is projected to be a $32 billion market in 2016 just puts a whole different slant on it. I think it's great for engineering students to have that. And we all know that as you look at this, you might say, well, this, uh, this is like an optimization problem. So we pushed hard. Glenn and I both pushed hard on trying to find ways that th this is not just guess and check students pressing buttons. It has to be coupled with good instruction. And, and uh, so that's a lot of the conversation that we've enjoyed. So there may be questions that are coming, and I want to uh, afford time for that. I will activate David Carr's um, microphone so that he may ask his question. Just one moment. Hi, David. Hi. Um, my question was, have you thought about making your model multivariate? And the reason I asked that is because uh, you you gave me and maybe your students the impression that that what matters is just profit and the engineering design. And in the real world, uh, there's a lot of other variables that uh, come into play. Can you give an example of what variables you're talking about? Well, in the case of this product, to me, one of them would be safety. Another variable might be uh, a manufacturing metric to be able to produce the product, but uh, how many of those you can make an hour or a day or whatever? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we, at the beginning, we thought about incorporating a, a whole bunch of different variables, um, but at this stage here, it, the, the model itself got too complex, and so we, we wanted to keep it, uh, and it's still pretty complex for me, but uh, you know, we, we, that's why we just selected these variables. but. In the future, we could, uh, you know, add on more variables. And I'll, I'll let Janice and Ramal speak to that more. There, it's yeah. I'm the engineer, so I can say they can do anything, but they're the ones who actually do it, right? <laughs> so I think that um, you know what we do is we calibrate what variables are are included, and as a group, we decided how to how to score that, right? Given the variables that we chose. But of course, I mean, you've mentioned two things. So I suppose in the case of safety, we're assuming, yes, it, it would be a safe catheter, right? But that's not a foregone conclusion, as you mentioned. And manufacturing speed could be another one. But as we understand the space better, we can add more and more parameters as we see fit, right? So if someone were to come up with a, a list of definitive parameters, we could add those in, and we could figure out as a team what, how to, how to auto-score the, the inclusion of 
those parameters at various levels in order to still come up with an engineering score. I just want to add that uh, because it's a, it's a dynamic system, it, it's like balance in an ecosystem. There is a model for a two-organism ecosystem. You can stretch it to a three-organism ecosystem, but as you add more variables, it becomes more and more delicate and, and harder to balance. So given, given the time span we had, uh, we came up with uh, sort of a, a best fit mathematical model uh, it, within the time span. And we, we, we reduced actually a few variables that we were thinking in the beginning because it wasn't realistic for us to, to build a more complex model. It would just take uh, too much time to test and develop. Right. And I think th these are the relevant variables where we get students engaging in this design task to see what variables they're going to manipulate in order to come up with an engineering design that's somewhat local to the catheter itself, right? Okay, we do have another question. It is from Amy Thompson, and I will now make Amy Thompson available to speak. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we can. Okay, great. So I, I had a question just about after the students take part in the activity. I was wondering if you led any discussions with them and what uh, feedback you got from the students after they participated in this module or activity. So we, we tried to do that. Since this was our first time implementing this activity, it did run a little bit towards the end of the semester. I think when we do this again, we'd like to have it sooner so that we could make better use of the feedback from students. But we did have at least one full class discussion where we, we let, let the students have a chance to talk about their experience with the micro world, what they learned about it. And they brought up a lot of other issues, too, about how they thought it related to things they were doing in their other classes or other projects. Um, they, in this class, because this is a freshman class, there's a lot of different things that come into play. And just coincidentally, because we have a, a lot of alumni guest speakers in the class who are working every day on innovation and on commercialization, a lot of the students wanted to connect it to specific things they heard about that you know alumni are working on in industry. So I, I highly recommend allowing time for something like this. And I think when we do it again, we probably allow a little bit more time for the after class discussion. Yeah, I can, um, you know, we also had some open-ended questions, and I will, uh, yeah, so here's an example of um, some of the open-ended questions. You, Terry, you want to, this was... Yeah, so um, some of the open-ended responses were really, really interesting for us. Um, because it was a chance for us to ask the students, so not just to see the result, but to ask them sort of their thoughts about how they came to the result. So you can see in this one here, the student, the student wrote that they found this by, by trial and error. Um, some of the other students were, were a lot less um, rational or a lot less systematic in their responses, but this is a pretty good one where um, the student clearly exp explained why they had to make certain choices in order to come to uh, the optimal engineering score and, and profit. Um, the one on the bottom, I think, was something we really hoped would happen. So for example, the student says, I found I could get a very high engineering score with a moderate profit, but I was able to find that the highest profits could be met with a lower engineering score. So again, we didn't, we didn't tell them anything about the equations that went into the model or the programming. We let them discover it on their own. And we were pleased when some students were able to discover this through manipulation of the micro world. So we also ran, uh, Ozge, who's here in the room, is a PhD student in our lab. And she hand scored all of these open responses. And we looked for correlations between the open responses and the various um, auto scored aspects of the micro world. And uh, we saw some very interesting, um, very interesting data positive and significant correlations between what they said in the engineering score and what they did in the manipulation of the micro world. So in subsequent um, tests of this, what we're going to do is ask more fine-grained questions to really get a sense of how, 
how they are concretizing this, this knowledge and how they might use it in subsequent tasks, right? Because you want them to come away with knowledge nuggets around entrepreneurial um, design and engineering design that they carry forward, that it's not simply a matter of doing this on time one and then walking away, but that they really start thinking about engineering from this entrepreneurial mindset, right? Um, and presenting this all the way along in, in engineering school or in um, undergrad engineering program, I think is these things have to be tightly married together. They can't do a four-year degree in engineering and then slap on a, a three-month module on entrepreneurship at the end. They really, really should be integrally involved. So in future, what we're hoping to do is, is um, get some additional funding from National Science Foundation or other engineering uh, organizations that would be interested in us building a full suite of these that integrate them into the classroom very tightly and design tasks around them where we can really capture what students are doing and how they're concretizing this over trials, uh, multiple trials and multiple micro worlds. And this is what we actually do in my, in my group uh, with our science micro worlds a, a, as well. And we do have a question from Alessandra Krushka from Washington University, St. Louis, and I will now activate her microphone. Hi, Alessandra. Okay, it looks like she might not have um, availability to her microphone. Um, her question was, how can other universities acro access the micro world to incorporate it in into their own classrooms? So I think this is something that, that we can work out in our lab. Um, these are uh, sub these are sub licensed to a small software development company that um, that I help run. And so if you send me an email and the Kern Foundation can provide my email, we can uh, find a way to to help that help help through that process. So I'm I'm easy to find. Also, is just Janice Gobert at WPI. Wonderful. And with that, um, we are going to wrap it up. Um, if you would like to view this webinar again, a recording of it will be available on our website. We will make an announcement as soon as that is available. Our next webinar will be on September 3rd. Melissa Marshall of Penn State will be presenting. Melissa Marshall is a senior lecturer with the Department of Communication Arts and Sciences at Penn State. She specializes in teaching communication skills to engineering and science students. Melissa held a workshop at our 2014 Keen Winter Conference. It was so popular that we actually invited uh, Melissa to come back and host the webinar. Um, the workshop that she um, held at the conference was designed to help engineers, scientists, and technical professionals make their presentations more understandable, memorable, and persuasive. The focus of the workshop was specifically on presentation that engineering, scientists, and technical pro professionals make to their colleagues and to management at their own institution and other institutions and at conferences. Um, we will send out an announcement with fur further details regarding this upcoming webinar, so we'll keep an eye on your inbox. Um, with that, now it wraps up our webinar, and we thank you for your participation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That sounds great, that webinar.